Lynn Hager, the Texas State Comptroller. He's been in the job over four years now. Um, when doing my homework to prepare tonight to introduce you, um, I found a good synopsis so that he can get on stage quicker than me reading his entire bio. That's a good idea. He is the CFO of the 10th largest economy in the world. He has, he has a big job. He's a busy man. And we're grateful you took time to be with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Susan, very much. That's an introduction I like right there. Short and to the point. Uh, yeah, I keep telling my staff, make it one sentence, Glenn Hager, controller, and then you can answer, I'll answer the questions. It's good to be with you today. Uh, great to be here this afternoon. And I'll first talk a little bit about what do we do in the controller's office, just a little history, and then talk about a couple of issues I see in state economy this legislative session, and then have to answer questions. So just a quick background. I grew up in a little bitty community northwest out of Houston, Hockley, Texas. You drive down Highway 290, you blink, you miss it. That's how big it is. Uh, if you don't blink, you'll see Hager Road. That's us. When I was out there with my three kids the, just the other day, and taking I, my son, I take him hunting quite a bit. I have a 13-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, a 13-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, and a 10-year-old son. And so uh, we went out there to uh, target practice on Saturday. And as we were getting off for the exit, my kids, they were going, one was saying, yeah, you know, uh, Siri doesn't know how to spell Hager. And if you do Google Maps, it says Hager this way and this and that. And as we turned on the Hager Road, which splits our, splits our family farm in two, uh, we're still actively engaged in agriculture out there. And one of my kids said, so how do you get a road named after you? And I said, well, it's called when the government takes your land to build a road, at least they give a consolation prize and name it after you. And I was like, I've told y'all that several times, but they must have missed that uh, at some point in time. But anyway, uh, with the three kids, you know, I, I grew up out there, a sixth generation Texan. And I've been serving in this capacity, as you heard, for four years in the controller's office. And what do we do? If you uh, go back to the days of Washington on the Brazos, was the first controller of public accounts, and obviously it's been an elected position since the current constitution been put into place. And if you look at this overall agency, we have I have about 3,000 employees that work for me, 26 different divisions. But if you look at what our core constitutional responsibilities are, there are three main things. Number one, we run the treasury. And, and as you heard, Texas, and think about this, it's really hard to imagine that Texas is literally the 10th largest economy in the entire world. When I was put in this job back in the fall, elected in 2014, started serving in 2015, you remember that we had oil prices that began to decline in the fall of 2014. They continued to decline in 2015. And so Texas, as a state, the 254 counties put together, some parts of the state contracted significantly. Permian Basin, the Eagle Ford Shell area, the Houston area actually went through probably about a three month period where it had, had no growth that year and went through a mild, very mild recession, just barely, uh, just barely below zero. Other areas, the Metroplex continued to grow, San Antonio continued to grow. What does it mean? Net net, the overall state as a whole in 2015, 2016 roughly had zero growth. Well, what am I going with that? When I got elected, we were actually the 12th largest economy in the entire world. I was very curious in looking at the data, the treasury numbers, looking at what was going on in Texas. Would Texas still be the 12th largest economy in the world? And I was convinced because we lost 100 plus thousand jobs in the oil industry and the manufacturing industry. And as I mentioned, certain areas of the state contracted, some continued to grow, but net net Texas was flat as overall, which was very different than Texas has been year after year after year and outpacing the national average. So I was very convinced Texas was not going to be the 12th largest economy in the world. How could it be when you don't grow? So as we got the from data from around the different economies of the world, I was right. We weren't the 12th largest economy in the world. But what I wasn't prepared to see is that we were no longer the 12th, we were the 10th. Well, what you didn't hear is that I'm also an Aggie. And what does that mean? Some people, when they when I say that, and they go, well, what kind of Aggie math did you use with an economy that didn't grow, had 160,000 job losses in two industry sectors, was flat, and you move from 12th to 10th? It just doesn't make sense. Well, Texas was larger than the economy of Australia, larger than the economy of Spain, larger than the economy to our southern border of Mexico. So you question, well, who do we move over and why? Well, the fact is the two countries we moved over in fact, had a larger contraction 
than Texas did. And who are they? Well, I'll give you a hint. They're a little cool and breezy outside right now. It'll be a little cooler and breezier this weekend. Well, the country that I'm going to mention first is straight north of here, and it's going to be a lot colder there than it is here on any given day in the wintertime. If you still can't figure it out, their flag is a maple leaf. If you still don't know who it is, they're good in hockey. If you can't figure it out, it's called Canada. Well, then who's the other one? Well, I'll give you a hint. The other one is also cold right now. Part of it's in Europe. Part of it's in Asia. And in fact, if you still can't figure it out, they've been talked about in the national media for four plus years now, day after day after day after day. I even read this morning the president is apparently working for this country. I did not know that. I thought he was sworn in to defend the Constitution of the United States, not this other country. You still can't figure it out. Earlier this year, uh, actually the fall of last year, my wife, she'll go through the kids' clothes, you know, as they're growing 13, 10, and 10, they continue to grow bigger. And so she's going through their closet, kind of reorganizing for school. And she said, hey, Glenn, uh, your son, he wants to come show you an outfit that he has on. I was like, great, sure, whatever that is. So he walked in our office. I turned around, and he just had pants on. No shoes, no shirt, just pants. And his pants were actually camouflaged. And so I looked at him and I said, Vladimir, how are you today? <laughs> and he was like, Vlad, who? Well, if you still can't figure it out, Russia. Think about that. The Texas economy is larger than the Russian economy. That is actually pretty remarkable to have that concept. So we run the treasury. So any of your taxpayer dollars, whether it's your federal dollars, your state dollars, every single dollar flows through my office and we're responsible to make sure the agencies appropriate and spend those monies the way the legislature had told them to a part of the Appropriations Act. The second constitutional responsibility, and this is the one where I always get very nervous, my palms get a little sweaty uh, when I tell people the second one, and that's because my grandfather on my mother's side was a Baptist preacher. And there in Little Walter, Texas, I used to go to his sermons before they, they moved off to another state, and I remember listening to Lowell's sermons, uh, Lowell Thompson's sermons, and he'd say, you know, how they stoned the tax collector in the Bible. Well, little did he know, many years later, he was going to give the implication when his grandson was sworn in as the tax collector for the state of Texas. Um, I still wanted to ask him, but I don't have that opportunity. Said, what did he think when he gave that implication? So, yes, I'm the tax collector. So, uh, hopefully, I don't see any stones out here. And then the third part is monitoring the state economy. And that means the day before a legislative session, I'm constitutionally obligated to tell the legislature how much money we estimate will come into the state treasury for the next two-year budget. Because they can't pass a budget unless they have an idea of how much money is supposed to come in the treasury. Now let me ask you a question. Anyone in this room with 100% absolute certainty can estimate how much money will come into your personal household, and don't raise your hand, it's none of my business in any shape, form, or fashion, but I try to make it as basic as I can to each individual. How much money will come into your household for the next two years? I mean, it's almost impossible. I see people's faces, you know, kind of really, uh, how, can, how, can you, how can you even begin to figure that exactly? I was in Colleen, Texas last week for a speech, and actually there in that same location when I gave that first uh, comment, I've been saying that in my speeches for years, and I had a gentleman who raised his hand. I looked at him, and I said, let me guess, uh, you used to work right across the street at Fort Hood. He said, yes, I did. And I said, I assume you're a retired military on a pension. He said, yes, I am. And I know every damn penny that's coming in my checkbook every month. <laughs> well, unless you're that individual, now you back up and imagine that that's a job that we have for an economy, 10th largest economy in the world, that doesn't start for a budget for nine months from now and runs two years later. And so the point being is that's the, that's the job that I had this past Monday, the day before a session. And as I told the legislature and I gave that revenue estimate and I talked to the, everybody in the media and I've given speeches all last week, day after day after day, and will continue to, I have made the comment that if you look at Texas today, in the last 12 months, we have had job gains of over 360,000 people into this state. 360,000 jobs. In fact, if you go back in the last 10 years, Texas has created over 2 million jobs. And what does that mean? That's roughly 25% of the job counts of the entire nation is right here in Texas. Now, also what I made the comment to is that if you look at from the revenues into the state treasury, the money that we collect as the tax collection agency has been stronger than it has been in a very long time. If you actually look in the course of the last year, it's almost as though Texas has been in a boom. That's how strong it's been. Let me go back to 2015, in November 2015, we had a collection that month in sales tax, because that's roughly 
60% of all collections, tax collections or sales tax, so that's what we talk about a lot because that's what drives the health of the state budget from year after year and what the legislature can or cannot do on a wide variety of things and about your money. And so in November of 2015, we had a historic month because we actually had a sales tax collection of two point, I think it was five billion dollars that month. We didn't have another one in December, didn't have one in 2016, we didn't have one through 2017 until you get to November, two years later. And in fact, in the last 13 months, we've actually had, uh, let me think about this, three months of 2.6 billion, seven months of 2.7 billion, two months of 2.8 billion, and one month that was just about 30,000 shy of being three billion. So my point being is, the Texas economy right now has been very healthy. Now, if you go back to that job count number I mentioned, over 360,000 jobs created in this state by men and women that run the businesses that keep this economy going, if you go back two years from now, when I gave that same revenue estimate, it was 173,000 job gains. And so the point is 173,000, a lot of states would love to have that, but it's half compared to what it is now. So when I said that, I also cautioned the legislature because people ask me, they go, wait, did you give them a whole lot of optimism? Or was that a whole lot of pessimism that you gave? I was like, that's just the right mix. And the reason being is I make the comment, and I said this the other day, and I saw somebody uh, had, had, had tweeted that comment out when I was getting an interview on Thursday morning. And I had made the comment, I said, you know, every morning I thank God that I get to call Texas home. I thank God that my family moved here in 1846, or my line got here in 1848, the second brother that moved here, and I get to raise my three kids here. But I also, as the guy who's looking over the economy of Texas, I also know that we're in the longest economic recovery in modern history. Next year, if the economy continues to grow in Texas, the United States as an overall, we will actually be in the longest economic recovery ever in this country. So that I also, when I wake up, thank God, and then I'm also looking because I know every morning when you're in that long recovery, every morning you're one day closer to the next recession. And so my pause to the legislature is that even though you've seen a historic boom, we do not expect that boom to continue. And one of the things that I have talked about for four years now, the very first day when I gave that revenue estimate, I said it this last week, I've said it over and over again, is Texas is blessed with a Permian Basin. And if you go back to an issue that Joanne had mentioned that I was going to talk about tonight and highlight, is that if you look at our Economic Stabilization Fund, which is our state's rainy day fund or our state's savings account, that fund today has $12 billion, and I did not stutter, billion dollars in it. Last year, I transferred an amount out of the general treasury because it's oil and gas severance taxes is how that money gets in there. This fund was created in the 1980s. If you recall, Texas had an economic recession in the 1980s, principally based on the oil and gas industry. Now, Texas is a much more diverse economy than we were in the 1980s. Now, it is nice to have people ask me how important is the oil industry. It's very important. But I give an example of a cake. Well, the economy of Texas, the cake, Actually, the oil industry is the icing on the cake. And some years it's pretty good, and some years it's not so good. If you go back two years ago, I transferred $734 million in severance tax collections into that state savings account. Now, a few years ago, if you recall, every dollar, every, certain amounts of money went in there. A few years ago, the legislature made the decision, the voters approved. Let's send half of the money to the savings account. Let's send half of it to transportation funding. I don't know if any of y'all got stuck in traffic lately. Uh, Roy and I were stuck a real long time coming over here, but we got here. So part of it was going to that. So two years ago, we transferred $734 million to both of those, highway funding and the state highway into the state savings account. This year, I transferred almost $1.4 billion into both. Now, the reason I say that is because that's almost double, but there's an old saying in the Permian Basin, after you have the high and it goes down, there's old saying, Lord, if you just give me one more boom, I won't waste this one. <laughs> and it's true. So one of the points is I've made the legislature for four years now. 
is that the last thing we want in Texas is to fund basic courses of government off of oil and gas severance tax. If you look at the credit rating history of our sister energy states, Alaska, North Dakota, our neighboring states, New Mexico, Oklahoma, whether it's Louisiana, half of the states that had their credit rating downgraded in the last three and five years were what? Oil and gas states. The other half was what? They had pension problems. So amazingly, the thing that I've been on the soapbox for four years now is how do we tend to our state's pension issues? How do we tend to our state's long-term liabilities? Because the last thing I want to do is pass on debt and responsibilities to my 13-year-old, my 10-year-old, and my 10-year-old. Last night in our house, and only in the controller's house, are you going to have a 13-year-old girl who's in eighth grade actually ask him about the national debt? How many 13-year-olds have you ever heard ask about the national debt? Obviously, I'm preaching in the house as much as I'm preaching out in the pastures to elsewhere. So if my 13-year-old Claire was asking about that, we were talking about that. Which is also to the issue that I've been telling the legislature is when I got in this job four years ago, I'm embarrassed to tell you and others that when I served in the legislature, in the House, and the Senate, until I got in this job and we had over $6 billion sitting in that account and I asked the question, what do we do with that money? I'm embarrassed to say I was one of those people. And by the way, they only got 143, 134 days left and they're gone. Yeah. Thankfully. Um, it made more work for me. But I had to ask, what do we do with those dollars? I was astonished, stunned, shocked to realize that $6 billion was essentially sitting in what's called the treasury pool, which what that means is overnight cash. Who in their right mind takes $6 billion and it's the equivalent of taking a shovel, digging a hole on the Capitol lawn, putting it in the hole and covering it up. Now, don't, if any of you are going down there for the inauguration tomorrow, which I plan to be there if I catch my flight back home, because I don't want to be the one with the seat empty right there behind the governor and lieutenant governor, and somebody's going to say, Hager must be protesting. <laughs> so I'm going to be there. I've got to get out of here to go back. But I don't want to see any of you with a shovel on the Capitol lawn because we really don't bury that $12 billion on the Capitol lawn. But my point being is, it doesn't even earn enough to cover the inflationary cost from year to year. Now that's not how you treat the taxpayers' dollars. And one of the points I have made, and I have made the argument that what we need to do with those dollars, instead of sitting them in a hole or putting them in a coffee can behind the ice maker in the freezer or burying them in a mattress, which no one does anymore. My office has 14 endowments. I don't care, give it to somebody else. It doesn't have to be the controller's office. My point is, say for example, the tobacco settlement dollars that my office was given, remember way back when, when there was tobacco settlements, my office got $1.6 billion. Now, Glenn Hager's not opening the newspaper to decide what to invest in. That's not how this works. I have advisory boards, I've got teams that work for me, we're looking at all the metrics of what other people are doing, and we're being more defensive than offense. In other words, we're just trying to cover the inflationary cost of this money. We're also trying to get a little bit more and what we've done with the tobacco settlement dollars, for example, was today, that money needs to be worth $2.6 billion, just to be worth the same amount as it was years ago. And it's worth $2.6, and I haven't checked the market today, so I uh, will when I get back in the office, but it's maintained that, and we've distributed about a billion dollars out to help lower health care costs with other states. That's what the decision was made. And so my point is, instead of keeping the money just locked, under the dirt doing nothing we should put it to use because it is the taxpayers money and in state of texas we're not new jersey thank god we're not some of these other states that have very significant pension problems but our pensions are not fully paid for and if we don't do something and i've been around this long enough that you can say oh it's a two-year budget we'll wait till the next one We'll wait to the next one. We'll wait to the next one. Well, that next one ends up being Claire, Julia, or Jonah that has to handle it, which are my three kids. And I don't believe that we need to pass it on to the future generations. And we need to be very open and transparent. And we need to make sure that we are tending to today's issues as well as those issues that are confront the future generations. 
And that's the reason it was amazing to me that Claire Hager yesterday wanted to know about the national debt because it scared the hell out of her. And you know, in fact, it should. The same thing as the state's long-term liabilities. And I said this to a group of legislators, and I've said it in other speeches, is that right now, my party is in charge. I've been in charge in elected office. I have a responsibility to make sure that people understand the state's books. They understand the transparency of those books, and then we make sure that we are facing the tough choices to deal with those issues in the coming sessions, so therefore we don't leave it to future generations. So I will stop there. Questions, comments, complaints. When you're dealing with financial numbers, I've learned one thing. You put people to sleep very fast. <laughs> so I learned to pause and stop. Yes, sir. Mr. Hager, I understand that Texas has a long-term debt of $48 billion. It may not be a lot for capita relative to other states, but $48 billion is a lot of money. Right. Tell us about that debt and what you're doing to reduce that debt. If you look at the state, the state's book, so when I get asked a lot of questions about what type of debt do we have in the state of Texas, whether that's state debt, whether it's local debt, the different types of levels. If you just look at the state debt, there's two principal types. And one, there are funding sources that are self-supporting. So revenues are coming in that are pulling to pay off that debt, whether it's bonds that have been passed for transportation funding, whether that is also bonds that have passed for higher education universities, uh, which is really funded on tuition dollars. The tuition dollars pay for it, but it has the full faith credit of the state behind it. So it's showing up on the state's books, which in reality, they don't pay it, but it is being paid through the university systems and tuition and the money that they get from the legislature, even though it's on our books. So there's some that's in their books that in reality is the state's not going to actually have to pay for it, but the full faith credit of the state is behind those, those dollars. So some are self-supporting, some are pure debt, which means part of the budget is going to pay for that. Now that pure debt portion, the state constitution limits state debt of only 5%. So Texas has a limit, unlike other states or the federal government, which has no limit whatsoever. So that one is a good thing that's in our state constitution. And I think if memory serves offhand, we, uh, and I haven't looked at this in the last six months, so I'm, I'm just going off complete memory. We're, we're not at the 5%, we're not at the 4%. So there's an amount that is allowable of debt that is out there, which I think is about 3.9%, but not all of that has been issued. I think it's more like 3%, and I'm going off just complete memory. So I, I'm, I'll go and check my facts tomorrow so it is a lower amount because some agencies get authorized to issue debt, but actually have not issued that debt. Do you have a question? Yes, I very appreciative of your, your efforts and I'm glad you're back. Is there a sweet spot, all other things being equal, where oil goes so high that it drags down economic activity? Right. Where, where, where would you like that West Texas Intermediate? Group? About 60 some odd dollars. And, and I think somewhere in that $60 range is good for the oil companies that can make money, especially in the Permian Basin, they can make money lower price than that. Obviously, you look at West Texas, intermediate crude is typically priced somewhere around $10 lower than Brent price, the global price. Part of that is because there's pipeline issues to get that oil out. The Permian Basin, amazingly, if you go back, Remember how I said the Economic Stabilization Fund, severance taxes go into that? It was set up in the 1980s. No one envisioned there being any more oil produced out there. No one thought this fund would ever have any money in it. So it was a state savings account, great idea, but the funding source had dried up. Modern technology capabilities have come back, and the Permian Basin is the most prolific field of growth, not in the nation, but the entire world. It looks to exist for many years now. So in the Permian Basin, the Eagleford Shell is a little bit more costly than that. Some of the other, other um, oil fields here in the Texas, natural gas and oil, but really somewhere in that $60 range. And the reason is that's good for producers and the economics of Texas from a job creation, but it's not too hard on us as consumers going to the pump and paying at the pump. But much higher than that, it really hits the pocketbook. Much lower than that, really starts shutting down economic activity. Let me go over here and then I'll come right back. Yes, sir. Okay, on your cash position that you were talking about, you do have an advanced drawing on 1% interest on that, right? Well, on, on our uh, on our 
portion that is in the equity pool, yes, it is in cash, whether we have our, we have our own Fed fund account and or we have it with the banks. Yes, that is correct. But you are drawing something. We are drawing something, but we're not covering inflation on it, which is somewhere between two to two and a half percent. Yes, so, that is correct. So does the state have the ability to other investment avenues? So the Economic Stabilization Fund in 2015, I went and asked the legislature because as my staff, one of them said, you know, hey, don't you think we should like show that we can ride on a bicycle with training wheels before we ride a bicycle? Which that's where I made the mistake because I should have went ahead and said, no, let's ride the bicycle because being a day or two on the job, well, we've been doing this on training wheels for 14 other endowments already, which was my mistake. Hindsight is 2020. So, yes. On a lot of those, we have different statutory authorities, like the tobacco settlement, where you can try to cover inflation plus a percentage. And again, we're not trying to make 20% return. I mean, that, that's not the defensive more than offensive. You don't want to lose the principle. That's number one. And then trying to earn a little bit more than that. I had somebody the other day that said, yeah, well, hey, here, I heard a rumor this. Oh, he's just going to earn like, you know, 4% interest on this. And, you know, they'll keep two for inflation. On 12 and then in two more years this is supposed to have 15 billion dollars if they don't use any money out of the ESF well I don't know what damn kind of math you're talking about but 1% 4% is a ridiculous sum of money that maybe y'all got that kind of money in your house well we don't in the Hager household I mean it's your money it's the taxpayers money and so it depends on the strategy that we have been told and since this fund was put in place in the 80s and no one envisioned it ever have anything in it because nobody thought, I mean, you've got major companies that sold everything they had in the Permian because they didn't think there was anything left. And they're buying back in for billions of dollars. I mean, now pick on Exxon, one of the biggest companies in the entire world, sold everything. They just bought a whole bunch last year for six and a half billion dollars. I mean, they thought there was nothing left. So it's changed. And so originally when it was put in the state statute, there was nothing to manage. And so I got the legislature on the training wheels to allow us to cover inflation on about half of it. And so now the other half is literally sitting in that bank account, which is not very prudent use of that money. Do you have a question over here? And then I'll make my way back. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what our unfunded pension plan costs are in the state? If you what look at, and I'm, I was sitting here and I was thinking I should have on the airplane look exactly what that, that uh, dollar amount is. The state, in order to keep our employee retirement pension system short up, is short about $235 million a year, is what it is today. And part of that is because employee retirement system, same as teacher retirement system, one of the, one of the tricks in, in the pension systems has been, it depends on what you estimate as your rate of return. And if you estimate you're going to get a higher rate of return, even if you've never been hitting that rate of return, then that kind of shoves your unfunded liability down. Well, Texas has recently lowered that in our uh, in endowments. We did that a couple of years ago. I mean, we lowered it before we started seeing that. And we, we, wanted to, we want to make sure that, that we're as conservative as can be. And so Texas ERS, teacher retirement system, employee retirement system have been lowering those, which then all of a sudden makes that liability bigger because you're assuming you're making less. I don't recall the exact total dollar amount, which I think is what you would like to know. I don't recall offhand, but I think both of them are somewhere, one of them is 78% funded, the other one I think is 85% funded offhand, which is not 100, which is what it should be, but it's not the crisis that it is in other states. They are in crisis mode. I want us not to get to crisis mode. There was there a question here, and then I'll come back one more. Yes, sir. Yeah, public education. Is there some place I can go to find out the whole story on the sources of income, public funds for public education, and how that's dispersed? How is dispersed within the public education yes. system? Elementary, secondary, and college, university. So Texas Education Agency keeps the public education information, K through 12. Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board has the data for the university system. When I was a legislature and we were doing school finance reform, well that sounds familiar, 
back around 06, I remember looking at the data and I went to all, I had 14 school districts when I was a state rep and I went to all of them and I was very frustrated because trying to get the data that TEA has, they have a lot of it, but I may have one set of data that's the original budget that was sent to them and then another set of data is the real time cost that's out there. One of the examples I remember is uh, I had two, two fast growth school districts, Katy, which is where we call home. Fort Ben ISD right down the road, and, and in looking at this, I'm sitting here going, wait, I got one school district that essentially spends no money on security, and I got another one that's spending a whole bunch, and y'all are both suburban school districts, I don't understand. Now, I understand little old East Bernard ISD, which has one campus, may have three buildings, but it's all on one campus, and they have the local constable patrol. So, yeah, they spent no money, but I'm thinking this doesn't make any sense. Well, one of them, they had a federal grant. And that wasn't showing up in the state data, which is a piece, my point is, if you don't have all the information, you can't make real decisions. And one of the things that we have a report coming out on public education by the end of this month, and in part of my, my, my frustration is what I call the Larry Mo Curley effect is this group of politicians are blaming that group and that group is blaming this group and I'm kind of like I just need to know what the problem is and school finance I mean me I'm kind of too simplistic of a guy basic math is supposed to come out exact like it's the same and you look at school finance and some people say oh well, the state shares this much and some say no it's this much well, there's only one state share and local share and what is it? And so that's part of what we're trying to make a point in this report. And another point of it is that when the current school finance system was put in place 30, 40 years ago, did you know every morning when you wake up, there's 1,100 more people in Texas every day? Every morning, 1,100 more people in this state than there was yesterday. 570 in natural growth, 530 roughly, plus or minus, moved to this state every single day. No one envisioned the state was going to grow this much. So the pressure in the school finance system of the first bucket is your local money, your second bucket is your state money, and what that is doing is it's causing your local share to go up every single year and your state share to go down. And so if you want to talk about property taxes, I mean you need to look at all governmental entities without a doubt. But if you live in the rural area, two-thirds of your property tax bill is what? ISD. If you live in suburbia, it's 50%. So the state average, because more live in suburban urban areas than rural areas, is 54%. And so you got to do, it's, it's school finance. Now, I'm not saying the other government entities get a, a pass. That's not my point. But if you really want to deal with this issue, it's school finance. And you got to have the math and the data. But those are the two principal sources to go to for it. Yes, sir. I appreciate this a little bit of you know, a political question. You know, Tea Party's fiscal responsible, personal responsibility. Why doesn't the state fund the pension plan 100 percent so everybody that's in it is whole? And I know the legislature has to do it, and then go to a defined contribution plan like every Fortune 500 company has, and then we are truly a pay-as-you-go state. And that's a great question because what I want to do with the economic stabilization fund is keep a portion of it. About seven and a half, seven and a half billion, which is seven to eight percent of general revenue, keeping in a state savings account for a true rainy day, which is an economic downturn or a god awful Hurricane Harvey, which so many of my friends and neighbors were absolutely devastated in. Other than that, anything above that amount does not need to be sitting over here waiting for a rainy day. That fund has had historically twenty three billion put into it, and it's had eleven billion taken out of it which comes to the 12 it has in it today. And so what do I think we should do with those dollars, that 250 million that's short? If we were able to treat it like we do the in tobacco settlement dollars in a decade plus, we will cover our pension problems in this state. And here's one of the things that, that a lot of people don't realize. We'll just change every employee to a defined benefit to a defined contribution. The problem of doing the current employees is you still have a big liability on your books. And some states aren't able to do that because of the constitutional issues and legal issues, and those are what you've been seeing playing out in the country. And so therefore my point being is, a lot of people say, we'll just change every person to that defined contribution. 
but the problem you still have some legal issues and you have a liability and so that's my point is what you were exactly hitting on we've got to shore this up even if we're going to change pension systems that's not a whole lot of benefit on dollar values because the current employee the new employees they're not the ones that's costing the system it's the current ones that are in it or about to retire that's where the cost is at so you're you're exactly arguing the points that i've been arguing out in the wilderness for like four years so great job children will thank you if you do yeah that's right that's right and kicking the can is not going to solve a problem and if you don't know what kicking the can means i grew up in hockey texas that means sweeping it under the rug that means postponing it to another day i said that in a speech many years ago a lady said i didn't want to ask this question i wasn't sure she came up afterwards she goes what does kick the can mean <laughs> So I learned to explain what kick the can means, just in case somebody didn't know. Do I have a seen it? Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, just wonder, you know offhand what, uh, what percent of the state revenue or federal funds and allocations have come in from the federal government, and whether it's a net gain or loss? Yeah, great, great question. So if you look at your state budget overall, a third of it is federal dollars, two thirds of it is state dollars. And the amount that we send to Washington, D.C., I had, I had some data put together from my staff on this, and we are a net donor state. We do not nowhere near shape, form, or fashion get back the amount of money that we send to the federal government that flows to the state coffers. And I'm trying to remember as I'm saying that to remember the exact amount. I don't remember off the top. There are portions that don't flow through the state budget, national defense and others that obviously we are a benefactor of. However, Texas, I can say with 100% confidence, we send more than we get back by far. Other questions, comments, complaints? Yes, ma'am, way in the back. Well, I'm reading Proverbs 1431. Ma'am? 1431 Proverbs. Yes. It says, whoever is kind to the poor lives to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. So I just believe that, you know, collectively for Texas. No, I agree. I mean, those that those that help the poor definitely reward themselves and others in their communities more than anything else. I mean, the last thing you need to do is uh, take charity for something you hope God's going to give you something in return. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, you post to out the pureness and the goodness of your heart. But I also think there's a very fundamental difference between government constantly, constantly trying to do more when we as communities can often do more as individuals than government as a whole, you know, because it, it steers off the tracks. Now, is it government's responsibility to build the roads, to educate children, to try to make sure to get society in directions? Absolutely. But, you know, I do know that there are a lot of very worthy charities that essentially run enormously efficient and effective systems without a tremendous amount of money. So I, I don't disagree, but I don't think government can be all for all, to all. Um, otherwise, we have a lot of problems as, as a country. Other questions, comments, complaints? Okay, if not, well then thank you all for letting me be here. And thank you.